welcome to our first holiday cookie show. I'm Nancy Stowes, food editor of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I'm Allison Sherwood, online producer for the Journal Sentinel's lifestyle site, Fresh. For the next half hour, we'll be talking about cookies, just cookies. Holiday cookies in particular. Our eighth annual special cookie edition of the food section came out in the, in the paper yesterday, December 3rd, featuring winners of our holiday cookie contest. And four of those winners are here in the studio with us today. We're going to talk to them in a few minutes. They'll be answering your questions that you submitted and hopefully sharing their cookie baking secrets with us. Among them is our first professional winner, and we'll be presenting her with her Golden Rolling Pin Award a little later in the show. We're also taking your cookie baking questions during the broadcast, so if you'd like to ask a question to one of our winning bakers, you can submit it in the box on this page or on Twitter, use hashtag cookie show. I'm looking forward to what our bakers can teach us about cooking. Their recipes were the best among 106 entries, which is almost wow. a record. Yeah, and that means that while we were judging, we must have tasted at least 106 bites of cookies. <laughs> and Allison, you know we tasted more than one bite for many of those cookies. Yes, there were a lot of great cookies. So let's take it, a look. In, well, in fact, since 2007, Allison, we've tasted more than 620 cookies. Oh. That's a lot of cookies. Our first contest back in 2007, actually it wasn't a contest that year, you're looking at the section right there. It was our first cookie section. We pulled a together a collection of about three dozen favorite and classic cookie recipes. In 2008, we initiated our reader recipe contest. Readers sent in 200 recipes on paper. We selected five dozen to test and chose 10 winners. And I wasn't a judge that year, but I do remember the winner, the Choco Butter Sweets. I made those at home and gave them to my they neighbors. Were very good. They still talk about that recipe. They were great. Then in 2009, we changed the format of the contest. We asked readers to deliver their baked cookies to our offices. That way we could judge not just the recipe itself, but also the skill of the baker. And the next year, um, 2010, the winner couldn't even taste her cookies because she has a gluten sensitivity. So her husband was her chief taste tester. Consequently, in 2011, when we decided to invite the reigning winner to serve as a guest judge, she brought in her nephew to taste the cookies in her place. And we also had a volunteer guest judge that year that was chosen from our readers. In 2012, the winner was a beautiful multi-layered seven-layer bar. That was really pretty. And in 2013, the winner was a family recipe for Italian fig cookies. And that brings us to 2014. We had some great cookies this year. It was really tough to make our decision. Yeah, and you know, being a judge is a lot of fun. You have to love sugar, though. It's, it's harder than it looks, it, than you would think. You have to taste cookies all throughout the entire week. By the last day, we're all kind of on sugar overload. But somehow on Friday, when we judge the finalists, we rediscover our enthusiasm. Yes, and, and, and again. seeing them right here <laughs> makes me want to eat them again. So. You can find all the recipes on jsonline.com slash cookies. That's all of this year's winners and all the past years that we just went through. You can find those recipes there as well. Before we meet our first guests, we have some fun cookie facts to share with you. The largest cookie ever made, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, measured 8,120 square feet. It was made by the Immaculate Baking Company in Flat Rock, North Carolina in 2003. The chocolate chip cookie weighed 18 tons and had a diameter of 101 feet. A new record was just set in October for the most people dunking cookies at the same time. That number is 2,152 set at an event in Market Square in Pittsburgh, sponsored by the grocery chain Giant Eagle. The tallest cookie tower ever built measured just over six feet high. It was created by the Girl Scouts of Nassau County in Garden City, New York in 2010. 60 Girl Scouts used 22,800 cookies to build the tower. Welcome back to our Holiday Cookie Show. Our first guests are the first and second place winners from this year's contest. Jane Matthews uh, won Best of Show for her um, very yummy, uh, spicy, exotic Three Wise Men treasures. She also won in 2011 for her Latvian Jam Bars. And this is Sue Shannon of Softville. She took second place this year with her salted dark chocolate turtle bars right here. Those were delicious. And she also tied for third place last year with her festive mixed nut bars. So Jane, tell us about your cookie. 
How did it come about, and can you explain the name? Sure. Um, well, I always look for something a little unusual if I'm going to enter a contest, and I thought, I wonder if anybody's ever used curry in a cookie. But it's a good flavor. Mm. Um, so I went online, and I actually found fa fa a couple of recipes for curry and cardamom. So I took that, and then I wanted to, to make it a little bit of a softer cookie, so I added some shortening, or I'm sorry, some margarine to that. And then I thought, since they're exotic spices, how about adding pecans and ginger and dates and calling them three wise men treasures to s symbolize the gifts of the Magi. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And Sue, can you tell us a little bit about your turtle bar? What makes this special? Well, I happen to think that the coarse sea salt and the dark chocolate make them pretty special. The original recipe uh, was made in a 9 by 13 pan, which made for a thicker bar. Okay. I made it in a larger sheet pan, which made it a thinner, more cookie-like bar. I switched from milk chocolate to dark chocolate, bittersweet chocolate, and then sprinkled it with not only the coarse sea salt, but al also the coarse decorative sugar, just to give it a little sparkle. Mm. So, Jane, you've won the contest twice now. <laughs> what are your secrets? Can you share uh, some advice for aspiring bakers? Well, if you're going to enter a contest, um, look for things that are unusual, that haven't been done before, variations on an old theme, um, just something that you find delicious that others would find delicious as well. And you mix a lot of different flavors in your cookie. What do you, how do you mix flavors? What, what do you look for? Um, I just experiment. If it tastes good, then I go with it. If it doesn't, I throw it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you read up on cookie baking and flavors or just learn by trying it? I learn by trying. Okay. And what are your secrets? My secrets? <laughs> well, um, the other cookie recipe that, that was um, posted in the journal, the Cherry Cherry Brazil Nut Slices, uh, was a recipe that I came up with based on a quick bread that somebody gives me every year for Christmas. It's beautiful with the cherries and the Brazil nuts. So I morphed that into a cookie by using an existing roll slice and bake cookie and kind of tested it a number of times. I was a little bit like a mad scientist in my kitchen <laughs> for about a week. And again, threw some out, but uh, determined which one was the best. And that was the one I entered in the contest. So something a little different and also pretty on a cookie plate. I okay. look for that. And you do a lot of baking. I know there are a lot of people out there who don't just bake a lot of cookies, but bake a lot of different kinds of cookies, and you're one of those people. So how many cookies do you bake, and what do you do with all those cookies? <laughs> I get them out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> I bake about, for Christmas, about 15 different types of cookies. Wow. And I probably make about 30 cookie plates that I distribute to friends. and. Uh, I volunteer at the Humane Society, and they're, they're very happy to get <laughs> big platters of cookies yeah. from me. Um, I just like to share, and people really seem to appreciate the cookies, so I love to bake, love to get them out of my house. No one's going to turn down a cookie. No. no. <laughs> and Jane, you take uh, treats and cookies to work. I um, do. Tell us about that. Well, I work at Children's Hospital in the emergency room, so it's always a intense place and people really appreciate going in the break room and grabbing something sweet and um, they're not too discriminative though they'll eat pretty much anything but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they do like my cookie. Mm -hmm. So um, for both of you who taught you to bake and what are some of your earliest baking memories? Um, my mother. My mother would make zillions of different kinds of cookies and I would watch her and just always had an interest and then I would try on my own. Mm -hmm. I guess my history is about the same, and we found out talking earlier that we both have Hungarian and German backgrounds, okay. strangely mm. enough. But yes, my mother baked a lot as I was growing up, and at 89 years old, she is still baking Christmas Wonderful. cookies. Wow. Fabulous. Yeah, many different types. Have either of you participated in a cookie exchange before, and what do you think works? How do you, you know, do a successful cookie exchange with friends? Yes, I have. You? Yes, I yeah. have. Um, just have fun again. Make the things you love, and you know it's all about having a good time with your friends, and people appreciate it. And it's nice to be able to taste other people's recipes as well. I'm sure everyone loves being in cookie exchanges with you guys because <laughs> you make such wonderful. Well, Thank if you. I if I were to organize a cookie exchange, I would be sure to tell people to really bring their best. Bring you know something that's a little outstanding not the you know run-of-the-mill things that we see mm -hmm. all the time I mean chocolate chip cookies are great but when it comes to holiday cookies you want something a little more a little special definitely have either of you had cookie baking disasters I think that's what everyone wants to know you know what what do you have any good stories of 
experiments that have gone wrong with all your experimentation? Oh, sure. Sometimes if you just maybe forget something, your head's not in the game. I've done that before. Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, what happened? In fact, I do have a story. It wasn't cookies, but I used to enter the state fair, and I made this cake, and it was in a beautiful mold, um, just lovely. And then I realized, as the judges were cutting into it, that I had forgotten uh, the wet, some of the wet ingredients, oh, so it just sick. fell apart, and they oh. looked at each other, <laughs> <laughs> and I knew. <laughs> and is that when you the, decided not to enter again? Or oh no, 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 no! <laughs> I still entered, but uh, you know, you're just you're just so busy. I think you have to just concentrate when you're baking and really, mm -hmm. you know, be by yourself. And, and how yeah, about you, so. Sue? Any disasters? Well, aside from having a very naughty Airedale Terrier <laughs> who <laughs> can easily reach countertops, I did have one thing one year with my Hungarian poppy seed nut slices, cookies that I've made for probably 30 years. And several years ago, I took out the dough and started slicing them, and I realized they looked different. I had forgotten the poppy seeds. The star what? ingredient. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of so what I did, though, was I brushed them then with egg whites, and I just sprinkled poppy seeds on top. So you make mm -hmm. do. Yeah. yeah. It still worked. Uh, so you have a tradition in your family with your sons of gingerbread cookies? Yes, yes, for many years. Yeah, it all started with getting a very cute uh, little book called The Ginger Bears. And they just loved it, and I started of experimenting with gingerbread cookies and I found a recipe I really liked with cardamom and several different spices in them and I have a really cute bear cookie cutter and I make these little ginger bears and I put a little red heart on it just like Aww. the little ginger bear, ginger bear story so to this day even though our younger son is 28 he still begs me to make those cookies mainly because he likes to eat the dough but <laughs> <laughs> also dough. loves the cookies. <laughs> Now we asked each of you to bring in one of your favorite special tools that you use while baking cookies. Jane, what did you bring? Well, since I'm an overachiever, I brought two. <laughs> I brought parchment paper, which I love. This, okay. You don't have to grease your sheets. It works beautifully. And then for uniformity, I use a scoop. That way all your cookies look even and the same. Mm -hmm. Nice. Now, actually, we did have a reader question ask about um, parchment paper. If, mm -hmm. Can you sub foil if you don't have any parchment paper, or do you know if that will affect I the... I don't. I wouldn't, because I think the foil, it, it sticks too much. Yeah. I've to never tried it. it, honestly, but I, this works much better. Okay. Stick to the parchment yeah. paper. Okay. Yeah. Right. And Sue, what did you bring? Well, I brought two kind of unique, unique things, an old thing and a new thing. I have had this little device for many, many years. What Some people it? might think it's for <laughs> muddling cocktails, but it's not. It's actually for making little mini tarts in a like in a little pecan tassies, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. like my little pecan cups that I make. I use the um, pie crust and I just pop it right into the mini muffin pan with this. It just makes for a really simple job. This is my new favorite toy. I have a KitchenAid mixer, oh. and this paddle has the rubber edges on the side, which makes it great because you don't have to scrape mm, yeah. your, the side of your yes. bowls. It's great. Yeah. It's made life much easier. That's Wonderful. great. <laughs> All right, let's see if we have any other reader questions. Um, we, we did have one mm -hmm. from, uh, from someone named Nixie. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Sure. Um, she uses white chocolate. She melts white chocolate for frosting her cookies. Mm -hmm. And she has a problem where it seizes up. She melts it in the microwave in a Pyrex bowl. Okay. Um, what might she be doing wrong? There's two things she probably could be doing wrong. First of all, if there's any moisture at all in the bowl, it'll cause your chocolate to seize. The second is white chocolate, you have to be really careful how you melt it. It has to be on a defrost and just do 15 second intervals and keep mixing it. And then just about as it's melted, then finish, mix, or finish melting it outside of the microwave. And that okay. should work for her. Okay. We have a couple just quick fun questions before we bring out our next guest. Um, all right, what's your ideal atmosphere for baking? Do you like to bake with people or do you want to be by yourself so you can focus? Sue? <laughs> Either one. <laughs> <laughs> I've done both. I guess I do most of my baking on my own, but I have had friends and relatives come over. We may, might do the, the cutout cookies together just because it's a fun project, mm -hmm. but if you, I guess if you really want to make a good, <laughs> consistent cookie, it's best to be on your own and just concentrate on the task at hand. So mm -hmm. you don't forget poppy seeds. Exactly. Right, exactly. Right, right. Or, yeah, not, or not set your timer, right, right. Yeah. critical timer. I'm the same. I like. Okay. I get up early and I bake while everybody's still sleeping. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and apron or no apron? No apron. Well, I do have one <laughs> that I wear during the holidays, just a whole, whole, whole Christmas one. It's <laughs> kind of fun. <laughs> Especially with cutout cookies because those can yeah. be messy. Yeah. And uh, what about music? Do you have music in the background? 
not sometimes, but not early in the morning because my family would not appreciate mm -hmm. that. Later in the day, Christmas yeah, carols. Day, absolutely. Maybe a little champagne. Sure. It's <laughs> fun. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, you can right. do that. Okay. All right. Well, so. uh, before we bring our next guest out, we have a few more fun cookie facts. Thank you yes, so yes, much thank for you joining both. us. Ooh. It was thank really you for having us. fun talking with you. Cookie cutters were introduced to America by Dutch and German settlers. Early American tinsmiths made them by hand back in the 1700s. For serious collectors of cookie cutters, there's a National Cookie Cutter Historical Museum. It's housed in the Joplin Museum Complex in Joplin, Missouri. According to foodtimeline.org, cookie exchanges, also called cookie swaps and cookie trades, first surfaced during World War I, and they were not necessarily connected with Christmas. Initially, they seemed to have been fundraising bake sales rather than cookie for cookie exchanges. Cookie swaps as we know them today were recognized as a rising trend in the early 1960s. Last year, the journal Sentinel produced an e-book, Best Holiday Cookies, featuring the winners and runners-up from the first five years of the Holiday Cookie Contest, along with cookie tips and favorite cookie recipes from the food staff. Available in Kindle, Nook, Apple, and Android formats, it sells for $3.99 at jsonline.com slash ebooks. There's also an option to give it as a gift. Welcome back to our Holiday Cookie Show. For this segment, we have two other winners from our Holiday Cookie Contest. Uh, Karen Herrera, owner of Sugar and Flour Bakery, love that name, in Greendale, uh, won our first professional division with her Mabel Pecan Pinwheel Cookies. And Jill Drury tied for fourth place with her Tea Time Cookies, and that's spelled T-E-E. -E. <laughs> They're right here. And there's a story behind this name. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I think any great holiday cookie comes with a story. Um, my family um, loves to bake during the holidays and everyone has their favorite cookie on the Christmas cookie tray. And my cookie in particular that I entered this year um, kind of was in honor of my grandpa who loved golf and who loved iced tea and lemonade and what better mix um, than to put that into a lemon shortbread cookie. The Arnold Palmer drink was kind of an inspiration, is that right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. And Karen, tell us about your cookie. How did it come about? Uh, well, I had an employee mention before the, con the contest was even announced that we should do a cookie with maple. Mm -hmm. So um, we started to think about it, kind of put it on the back burner for a while. Um, and then when the contest came up, we thought, OK, what can we put with maple that would make it kind of a, a special holiday cookie? And what seemed like a natural fit? was pecans. Um, mm -hmm. Christmas cookies to us are more fancy than our normal cookies would be, not like just a drop cookie. So we thought we would do like a cream cheese dough and um, fill it with the pecan streusel and kind of roll it up into a, a pretty shape. Mm -hmm. And they are very pretty. Yes. And your professional baker, your yes. bakery focuses, you, s you sell just cookies. Just cookies why, and bars, yes. Why cookies? Cookies are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't get tired of making cookies. Um, we started our, our business online, um, and cookies are very simple to ship. So when we um, moved into our current bakery space and we branched into having a retail business, uh, we just kind of thought we would stay with that format. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's worked out well. I mean, we have about 15 different kinds of cookies, and we rotate them seasonally. And it, it has been successful for us. Great. And Jill, you are, are a, a pharmacist by profession. I am. And, <laughs> and I could use a glass of milk <laughs> right now, <laughs> sitting next to the professional. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that after the show. <laughs> milk and cookies for all. Um, so you, a few years ago, you and your fellow pharmacists formed a cooking club. Um, what's the connection between pharmacy and cooking? Um, well, I'm a bit of a nerd, I guess, as all science pharmacy people are, and um, I think it's pretty easy to think about cooking and baking um, and science all together. Um, I think after all, every recipe is somewhat of an experiment. <laughs> and um, I always loved baking and cooking uh, with my mom uh, in particular and, and really kind of 
got away from that when I went to pharmacy school and then I thought, well, why can't I continue to do this and pharmacy? And um, being healthy is really important and it's not just important to me but to many of my patients. So it was easy to form a little baking and cooking group with them and <laughs> share recipes and share successes and failures all together. Again, it's just experimenting every day. Yeah, you have to be very precise with baking, just like with pharmacy. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, you have to watch what you're measuring and pouring, but at the same time, um, I think it's important to take risks and kind of see what works, because when you think about pharmacy, not only is it just mixing and pouring, but it's also drug development, just like recipe development. Mm -hmm, yeah, very true. So kind of taking the same concepts that are very comfortable to me in my profession and taking them at home is, is a fun little journey to be on. Mm -hmm. And with risk taking and precision and all those things, Karen, what are your um, secrets behind your recipes or what, what do you keep in mind when you're developing recipes? Or how about what would you, um, advise a home cook when they're working yeah. on a recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, think about flavors that would go well together but aren't necessarily common. So, um, you know, you could take a chocolate chip cookie and you could, for instance, when we were developing our malted milk chocolate chip cookie, we took a regular chocolate chip cookie recipe and we changed the chips and then we added um, different types of malt powder to the dough to change the flavor of the dough and what has resulted is a, a completely different cookie than a regular chocolate chip cookie just by adding three different ingredients like we've a devised. Chocolate malt in a cookie it sounds like. Yes. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so Karen this is a question that several people have asked us and we wonder about too. Sugar cutout cookies are hard to pull off successfully because yes. they can be beautiful and bake nicely but taste like cardboard. Cardboard, <laughs> yes. Um, you have to find a really good recipe um, or change a recipe to suit your tastes. Our recipe, um, it was given to me by somebody else. Uh, and I've kind of just held on to it all these years and I haven't changed anything um, because it's a good solid recipe. It doesn't have any leavening in it, so oh, okay. a, a common problem with sugar cookies is that you cut them out and then you put them in the oven and your, your gingerbread man is all of a sudden really fat. <laughs> um, if there's no leavening in the dough, your dough is not going to spread. So um, really you just need a good solid recipe as the base and then the frostings you can kind of experiment w with what you want. We use royal icing because we ship our cookies so it, um, it dries hard mm -hmm. but for somebody that is just baking at home and keeping them they could do something like a buttercream. And so another reader asked um, how to get soft sugar cookies and would that have to do with the leavening then? I don't know if it's necessarily the leavening. Um, they're going to get harder the longer they bake. Okay. So if you want a softer cookie, it could bake for less time and be less dark. Okay. And, um, oh, Karen, so you have kids at home. I have yes. a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and they, you know, the three-year-old at least, loves to be in the kitchen with me. Yes. And <laughs> sometimes it, it's fun, but, you know, they're not always very helpful. But no. what, when you bake with your kids, what are some tips for getting kids involved with baking? Give them something easy to do. Um, when I'm baking with my girls, I, if I'm baking cookies, I let them do some of the measuring. Then um, I handle the mixer. Um, they will do the rolling or the cutting out or the scooping of the cookie dough, which is, it's simple. And then I handle all the oven stuff and then with like the decorating, I just put everything on the counter and I take a step back <laughs> and they just do That's their the thing. Part. Yes, <laughs> and you just have to know as a mom that it's going to turn into a gigantic mess. <laughs> Let them do it and then when it's done, clean it up. Yeah. Yes. So Jill, you've described yourself as a perfectionist. That would probably make you nuts. <laughs> um, uh, how does that factor into recipes that you choose to make? Uh, sure, I mean, time is a 
it, it is an unspoken ingredient. And a lot of the time, people, you know, we mentioned before, cookie exchanges, um, you know, you'll get these cookies and maybe they aren't your favorite because people don't necessarily put as much time into things as you put into um, <laughs> the, the cookies you baked. Um, I try to make little masterpieces, <laughs> which, um, you know, is sometimes a, a mixture of a, of a pharmacist personality, maybe. Um, but, yeah, I think it's hard to um, balance that in the kitchen, but it's also um, easy when you have someone with you uh, who's a great taste tester. I have a mm -hmm. husband who definitely isn't a perfectionist, which I love that about him, so I can mm -hmm. give him anything that I think is a failure and he will still think it's still great. Loves it. <laughs> yeah. So we asked you guys, to also, you two, to also bring um, a special tool. Can you describe what you brought? Uh, sure, I can go first. I brought my mortar and pestle. I've had this for years and um, I have used it for many, many things. Um, grinding uh, in, uh, in particular and I used this uh, to grind the tea that is in the tea time cookies. Um, but obviously mortar and pestles have a, a variety of uses in the kitchen and I mm -hmm. think they're a great tool and they look nice on the yeah. shelf. And Karen, how about you? I brought um, my favorite rolling pin, <coughs> uh, which is a French tapered wooden pin. Um, and I was first introduced to these by my mother-in-law when she was teaching me how to make tortillas. And I was using a very heavy marble rolling pin and she said, no, 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 <laughs> and went out and bought me this pin. Um, and it's very comfortable um, and it has over the years weathered and become very non-stick with the amount of butter that has been <laughs> pressed into it. The so more you use good. it, the better it gets. It's, that's absolutely true, sure, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. We have uh, time for just a couple more questions uh, before we wrap up. Um, a couple readers wrote in about those stamp cookie cutters that leave an impression on the cookie and how they bake out, the detail bakes out. Do you have a suggestion for how to make a cookie that won't lose detail in the baking? Um, I have two, two thoughts. One would be to chill or freeze the cutout before putting it in the oven. Um, and the second would be, again, going back to the leavening, a cookie that doesn't have like baking soda or anything mm -hmm. in it will not puff up and lose the detail. Okay. And with, um, with your business shipping cookies everywhere, what kinds of packing techniques do you use or what kinds of cookies ship well if you're sending someone gifts from afar? Uh, bubble wrap is imperative. <laughs> you have to use a lot of bubble wrap. Um, Be also... Between layers? Is that what you do? Between layers and um, we kind of make a bundle and then tuck more bubble wrap around it. You want the cookies to be in the box uh, snugly but not packed in so tight that there's no room for a little a little bit. I kind of shake the box and if I can hear things moving around you have to pull them back out and put a little more packing in. And you mentioned royal icing does well for shipping. Very well, versus yes. If it's dry, dry. You're, you're, yeah. you're fine. You let it dry overnight yes, first. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, and then unbleached flour versus bleached flour, does that make a difference in cookies? I don't mm -hmm. think so. I mean, there must be a reason behind it, but I... I go with whatever's in my cupboard. Okay. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, we have one special official duty, and that is to present Karen with her Golden Rolling Pin Award. So there you are. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> so that concludes our holiday cooking show, cookie show. Um, thanks to all of you who watched and submitted questions. And thank you, Bill Schultz, for being our producer. And you can find all the recipes again at jsonline.com slash cookies, the recipes for these cookies, and all the rest of our winners and runners up. There's 30 recipes in all. And don't forget about our e-book, um, Best Holiday Cookies. Uh, that is at jsonline.com slash ebooks. It's $3.99 and makes a great gift. And whether you're a home cook or a culinary professional, we would encourage you to consider entering our contest next year. You can find details starting in September in the newspaper and on jsonline.com and fresh. 
And who knows, maybe next year you could be sitting here with us chatting. Thank you all again and have a happy, healthy, and delicious holiday season.